Yes, uh, we can start. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to this IFFR conference on asset management for occupational pensions. So good afternoon to Europe. Good morning to you, Canada. And good evening to Asia. We're thrilled to have a really wide audience from all continents. For those of you who are not familiar with the Institute of Finance and Financial Regulation, let me uh, spend uh, one minute navigating you through this initiative. So IFFR is an international research center which uh, was founded in 2018. So it's relatively young, yet it's expanding very fast. It is founded under the auspices of the Department of Banking and Financial Management of uh, the University of uh, Piraeus. So this is the oldest department in finance in Greece. It's well known. And the mission of IFFR is to bridge the gap between cutting edge academic research in finance and the industry. So our motto is access, connect, share. We access cutting edge knowledge, academic knowledge. We connect with the industry and we share this knowledge with you. So we are not an event organizer. We are a think tank. A think tank where business and academia converge, we spot the needs of the industry, and we provide solutions to you through our consulting and training services. To achieve our mission, we have composed a team of distinguished, highly distinguished academics and professionals who are coming from leading institutions worldwide. So we have well-known academics from universities like Yale, Cornell, Chicago, Northwestern, UBC, LSE, Imperial, Cash Business School, Queen Mary, and others. We also have leading professionals in the team of our fellows who are coming from leading institutions as well and who have shaped the strategies of these institutions like Goldman Sachs, Citigroup, Soros Fund, and hedge funds. Before moving on, let me thank us, it is always the case. Let me thank, first of all, our distinguished speakers. As you will see, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers. And of course, we would like to thank you, our audience, who are going to spend these two days with us. I would also like to thank our valuable sponsors, in particular, Eolcus Investments, which is our gold sponsor, Piraeus Asset Management, Mutual Fund Management Company, and Systemic, who are our standard sponsors, and also Alpha Trust, who is our supporter. May I say at this point that we view our sponsors as collaborators. So we would like to call them partners. We want to build long-term relationships with our partners. They form an integral part of our organization. And may I take the opportunity and state that we have an open call for partners. So if you are interested, if we ignite your interest, then feel free to get in touch with us so that we explore opportunities. May I also thank our media partners, in particular, Economia Group, Euro Today, Naftaboriki, Next Deal, and the Savvy Investor. I would like to say that this has been a quite long effort, especially organizing today's conference. And to this end, I would like cordially to thank the IFFR staff, and in particular, Despina Kodopoulou, who has been our media and marketing officer. I would like also to thank the Ventora IT team for their tireless efforts, Hartis for the design of a beautiful website. And I would also like to thank Irini Peradonaki from the University 
of Pireus for her assistance. You will see in the platform, you can find a digital booth where you can find more information about our sponsors by clicking on their logos. And you there you can also find information about IFFR as well. Coming now to the conference, um, very briefly, I'm going to state that the structure is going to be in two days, deliberately in two days, because we know that we are all very tired from this continuous stream of webinars and online conferences. So we decided, we thought that it would be better to split this conference in two days so, and also enable interaction with the audience. Feel free to submit questions via uh, the chat room that you can see uh, on the platform. And at the end of each session, the chair is going to take questions and uh, you will interact with the speakers as well. So as I said, we're going to have basically two sessions. The first session is going to be about the international evidence from occupational pensions. The second session is going to be about investment strategies. The conference is going to be concluded by a panel where again, you will have the chance to interact with uh, the speakers. The, as you will see, we have really good speakers, excellent professionals, both academics and from the industry. And this reflects, as I said, the philosophy of IFFR, which is really unique. So without further delay, let me introduce our first distinguished speaker, Professor Panos Tsakloglu, who is the Deputy Minister of Labor and Social Affairs in Greece. Panos is in charge of the social insurance. Apart from this affiliation, Panos Tsakloglu is a well-known academic. He is a professor in the Department of Economics in the Athens University of Economics and Business. Um, he has really a vast experience in academia and in the industry. He has served as advisor to two former prime ministers in Greece. He has served as chairman of the Greek government's Council of Economic Advisors. He has been an alternate member of ECOFIN and Eurogroup. He has leading academic publications, and he's also serving as a research fellow, senior research fellow at LSE. So, Minister Takloglu, dear Panos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the honor to have you with us. Thank you very much, George, and thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, the conference comes at a crucial juncture for the development of occupational pension funds in Greece. In recent decades, uh, globally, we have witnessed a rapid growth of occupational pension funds. 50 years ago, occupational pension funds had a significant presence in just a few countries. They constitute primarily the choice of an alternative insurance model. During the last two or three decades, mainly due to demographic aging, they expanded rapidly in most developed and actually in several developing countries as well. And they are becoming increasingly vital in a, as a supplementary pension pillar. Greece, unfortunately, did not follow this trend. However, even with a delay of a few decades, today a favorable situation is shaping, which supports the dynamic growth of the second pillar of the Greek pension system. In the Ministry of Labor, we consider occupational pension funds as a crucial factor for the support of the well-being of our elderly compatriots and by extension society at, at large, as well as a vehicle for increasing Greece's very low, by European standards at least, savings rate and a means to boost investment and growth. Hence, we welcome the development of the occupational pension, fund, pension funds. The increasing importance of occupational pension sector and the crucial social role of pension savings for the welfare of the future pensioner increases the need for vigilance at all levels. At the level of the supervision and the governance of the pension funds, at the level of the structure of the pension products offered, at the level of the management and the, of the accumulated assets. 
A prerequisite for the dynamic growth of the sector is definitely confidence and trust. We absolutely need the full trust of the insured in the institutions where they place their pension savings. This trust is in turn linked to the responsibility of the state to guarantee the institutional shielding of the occupational funds and the strict but operational supervisory framework that will safeguard the interests of the insured, the sector itself, as well as the national economy as a whole. To this end, in the Ministry of Labor, we plan to strengthen the competent supervisory authorities and move from the current frag fragmented scheme to a single supervisory structure. As you all know very well, the management of insurance funds reserves is a major strategic, strategic challenge for the sector with high social, institutional, financial and economic implications. Two concepts play a, a central role, role in asset management, as in all finance, returns and risk. In an it is an optimization exercise, risk taking to achieve the highest possible returns while keeping portfolio potential loss risk control at the minimum possible level. The implicit trade-off and this is a lasting balance, I would call it a dangerous uh, tango, if I may say. Let me give a partial metaphor from the current pandemic. Uh, we are fully aware that uh, we undertake a health risk by partially opening up the economy for the sake of growth, social balance and mental health. Precisely for this reason, the opening up should be accompanied by exhaustive monitoring and continuous redefinition of the policy measures required to keep the health risk at check. Unlike the reaction to the pandemic that I mentioned before, in the case of asset management, the corresponding tango is long lasting and not limited to just one or two years, as we hope that will be the case with the pandemic. In fact, in the context of extremely low interest rate in rates in recent years, the exercise has become more difficult and complex and the balance more delicate, more or less as if operating in a highly contagious environment, pandemic environment in the context of the previous metaphor. Very low interest rates create the need for higher risk uh, taking by in reserve portfolio in uh, reserve portfolios, which in turn creates the need for better risk management, greater di diversification, as well as increased vigilance and alertness. For example, due to lower interest rates, a trend to increasing the share of alternative investments in reserve portfolios is taking place in many countries, in infrastructures, real estate, private equity, and so on. This increases diversification, but introduces new risks, especially in the field of liquidity. Increasing risk taking, ever expanding rates of asset classes and investment instruments, and investment in the, and investment instruments generates the need for better risk monitoring, more accurate measurement, more investments in information technology, as well as higher skills in risk management. Further, Asset management costs constitute a very important factor in the saving of the final benefit of the insured pension that the insured person will enjoy. Her or his uh, pension incorporates decays of returns and by extension accumulates decays of management costs. Lowering management costs is greatly facilitated by economies of scale, while sector frag fragmentation and small pool of assets push in the opposite direction. From a broader social uh, perspective. Nowadays, global pension funds account for a very large share of institutional assets and can play a crucial role in the function of international capital markets. In this framework, the socially and environmentally responsible investment of the pension assets can hardly be underestimated. And this is another dimension of the wider role that the second pillar has to play. The governance of occupational funds using fit and proper criteria for the selection of board members, as well as highly experienced and skilled investment team, and the appropriate allocation of responsibilities between them is of utmost importance for the smooth operation of the system. To retain the trust of both insured individuals and the society at large, at each level of the investment chain, decisions must be taken by fit and proper individuals, maintaining full, sorry, maintaining uh, fully and fully respecting their roles in terms of responsibility, accountability, and transparency. Last but not least, let me say a few words about the major reform we are currently undertaking in the first, first pillar of the Greek pension system. Our intention is to gradually transform the system of auxiliary pensions from national defined contribution to fully funded system. In this context, 
context, we expect that the population will become more familiar with saving and investing for the sake of pensions. And in the long run, we anticipate that this will have beneficial effects for the development of the second pillar too. Ladies and gentlemen, the role of occupational funds in the pension system is crucial and is important is likely to rise in the future. Our responsibility is to provide a fair, transparent, transparent, stable and level playing field that will allow the flourishing of the second pillar. Uh, I happen to know the organizers and their good work. Hence, I strongly believe that we will have a very fruitful exchange of views in the next couple of days and a very successful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Panos. Um, thanks a lot. I think uh, we can move on now to our first session, which is going to be chaired by Dr. Michael Anthropelos, who is an assistant professor in the University of Piraeus and also an IFFR fellow. So, Michael, it's over to you. Uh, thanks, Just George. Before uh, uh, Michael starts, uh, sure. you will excuse me because I have several other obligations in the ministry. Uh, frankly, every success to your conference. Thank you very much, Manos. Bye bye. Uh, okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. Uh, I would also like to thank the, uh, for uh, everybody for attending our conference in uh, asset management for occupational patient funds and trends and developments. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, all the uh, speakers for their uh, uh, valuable uh, participation to this event. And of course, Professor George Kadopoulos, the director of the IFFR for the excellent organization of this event. So since occupational pension funds are such, uh, is, is really an important pillar for uh, social, uh, social pension system all over the world, especially now in, with so many changes and new challenges for the asset management cure, such an initiative uh, as this event, as this conference is extremely helpful in steering us to the right direction. I'm also particularly pleased to chair this today's session. Uh, which sets uh, lights uh, to on international event evidence of, on uh, occupational pension funds. As you might know, in Greece, uh, the institution of occupational pension funds is relatively new compared to other countries, and thus uh, the, the, the international experience of today's experts uh, is uh, is really valuable, indeed, really valuable. So let me uh, introduce the first speaker of uh, today's session. Uh, Mr. Theodor, uh, Theodor Economou, with 25 years experience in both asset management and advising to pay on funds uh, worldwide. Uh, Mr. Economou has served uh, as a chief investment officer at uh, Lombard Odier Investment, where he oversaw uh, the management of uh, more than 6 billion Swiss francs in uh, pay on fund uh, assets. Uh, he currently serves as an advisor to the BEA, uh, BAE uh, pension schemes in the UK and uh, is also a member of the uh, Investment Advisor Committee of the Virginia Retirement uh, uh, System in the uh, in US, one of the largest, uh, worth 50, 50 largest uh, pension funds. Uh, before uh, Lobart uh, ODA, he had provided uh, his uh, services to Accenture uh, CERN Pension Fund and ITT Corporation in New York, uh, receiving several distinctions and awards for his asset management performance. The talk for uh, the talk of his the title of his uh, today's talk is Occupational Pension Funds Investment. Uh, what will it take to continue to be successful? So, Mr. Economo, the floor is yours for about 20 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mihaly. I appreciate uh, this, this introduction. And um, I will uh, make my best for the next 20 minutes to answer the, the question that you asked me to address, which is what is the state of the industry uh, today? Um, my message is, is, is very simple. Uh, and I will show you with some data that uh, occupational pension fund investments have been a tremendous success over the last 30 to 40 years. However, uh, today, managers, uh, practitioners of occupational pension fund investments are facing significant challenges. And they're trying to address these challenges by rethinking portfolios and bringing a number of tools into the management of those portfolios. And I will try to provide an overview of that and explain why it's so exciting. It's a really exciting time to be managing uh, pension fund uh, portfolios. 
uh, today. So uh, how do we um, uh, how do we look at the past success of uh, of pension fund in, uh, in investments? Uh, I chose to take the example of uh, of Switzerland. Uh, why? Because uh, the Swiss system has had a stable framework for the last uh, 35, 40 years. So there is long-term data that is meaningful. Uh, it's also a stable currency, so comparisons over time make sense. And it is a system that is a uh, significant scale. It uh, mounts in more than, to more than one trillion in assets in to total, more than $1 trillion. And so we can infer some conclusions that are applicable also at a wider, at a wider level. So how has the system done? Uh, on this chart, uh, you can see in the black line, the performance of the reference portfolio for Swiss pension funds, so-called LPP40, it's the industry standard. And it's called like that because it has 40% equities. And you can see the performance from 1984 when the current framework was defined after the law was passed until today. The vertical axis, you can see the return, and you can see that this portfolio has uh, returned more than 600% over that period. That corresponds to an annual return of 5.7% uh, on average per year, uh, which is really a tremendous success. Uh, this return at this level in Swiss francs, a strong currency, has allowed to keep contributions low, has allowed to keep pensions at a high level. Importantly, as practitioners, when we look at this, we look at this 5.7% figure relative to cash, which if you will, is the alternative if you don't invest. And over the same period, the re average return on cash was 2.2%. So the 5.7% is three and a half percent above cash, a very uh, strong number. Now, uh, what is the portfolio that delivered this very nice 5.7 return, three and a half percent above cash? It's shown on the left of this slide, it's 40% equities, 60% bonds. It's very interesting because it's a very simple portfolio. It's composed of five index strategies, uh, three in bonds, two in equities, and therefore can be implemented also at a very low cost. It has one uh, drawback, that it is subject to significant drawdowns. Uh, they can range from minus 15%, as we saw early last year with the coronavirus crisis, to minus 45%, uh, as we saw in 87. And so the condition to making this 5.7% compound return is, of course, not to sell during these difficult periods. Can this good performance, uh, this very strong performance, 5.7% per year continue? Uh, I don't need to tell you, most in the audience are professionals or professors or academics. Uh, you know there are significant challenges. There are challenges shown here on the left from the bond market where yields globally have been going down as the bond prices have come up globally. And importantly, there are challenges from the rates market where in Germany, the reference for the Eurozone, uh, current rates are at minus 40 basis points. And in fact, in Switzerland, in Swiss francs, they're at minus 75 basis points. There are also challenges, as you know, from the equity markets. On the left-hand side, the cyclically adjusted PE ratio is above 30, something that only happened in the 1929 crisis and in the early 2000s bubble. Uh, so valuations are expensive. And on the right-hand side, the S&P, for example, the US market you can see is at all-time highs. Now, even if we assume that uh, investments can continue to deliver 3.5% above cash, despite these challenges, we still have a problem. Why is that? Uh, this is shown on this slide, um, and it reflects the thinking of the industry today. You can see that uh, if we add the 3.5% return above the current level of cash of minus 0.75 base points, three francs, or min minus 40 bips in euros, by the way, that 3.5% applies to all major currencies. It's in the same order of magnitude, right? Uh, in Switzerland, in the Swiss example, to stay uh, coherent with our framework, we get only to 2.8% expected return for the future. That's one half the historical return. And it is significantly lower than typically the 5% level that such a system needs to perform. And in the US it's higher, the expectation tends to be in the five to 7% range. And it is this kind of thinking that has led 
In effect, in the recent survey by Create Research, 77% uh, of respondents to agree with the statement that asset returns will be a lot lower in the following decades, a truly shocking result. But you heard Amin Rajan, who, who, who did that survey, who spoke at the last seminar of IFFR, share directly with us uh, that, that result. Now, as if this was not enough, uh, we live in a world that's in the midst of change. Digitization is impacting everything we do. There are significant environmental and social challenges and their response in terms of populism, monetary policies adding complexity. And of course, we are in the middle of healthcare, healthcare crisis. So what is the industry, what are practitioners reaching at to try to bridge that return gap of about 300 basis points uh, that is required for occupational pension fund investments to continue to deliver success. Well, uh, the same survey um, by Create Research identified three priorities to which I added two. Uh, the top three priorities are one, increase the allocation to private assets as opposed to publicly traded assets. Second, integrating increasingly uh, environmental, social, and governance considerations into investments, with the latest version being thematic investments. And third, looking at investments under a risk angle, and in particular, the latest development there is dynamic risk asset allocation. These are the top priorities that come from the survey. And they also reflect, by the way, uh, the program tomorrow, and we have some terrific speakers that will help dig deeper. I will provide a practitioner's perspective of why these are priorities for the industry. Uh, I added to these two from my experience, cost management and governance. They were mentioned by Panos, I was very happy. And I will explain why these are also uh, very important uh, tools. Now, let's go into this. Why are uh, allocators looking at private assets? Well, very simply, uh, they're looking at data such as the one on this slide, in this case, it comes from BlackRock, that show that the performance of private assets has provided a significant premium, alpha as it's sometimes referred to, over public assets, typically in the order of 500 plus basis points in equities and 300 plus basis points in debt. This is very attractive because you think about it, look at the LPP40 portfolio we discussed before. If you had half of your portfolio in private assets providing this type of overperformance, you've solved about two thirds of that return gap that we're trying to address. Now, um, there are other reasons also to look at private assets today, less discussed, but very important from a practitioner perspective. The first one is that private assets are a very significant part today, much larger in the past of the investable set. In the US, they represent privately, uh, private firms represents more than 50% of the economy's revenues and more than 50% of capital spending. Uh, in addition, as is shown on this chart, uh, the number of publicly traded companies has steadily declined. Over the last quarter century, it's gone from nearly 7,500 to less than 4,000, significantly reducing the investable set, while the number of private companies has steadily increased. Uh, an anecdote is that the, the well-known Wilshire 5000 index that is supposed to represent the entire US market doesn't have 5,000 companies in it because there aren't 5,000 companies to invest in in the US uh, today. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll hear uh, about this uh, more uh, in more detail from Elise Gourier uh, tomorrow. Uh, but I want to point out that today the possibility exists even for smaller funds to invest in private assets. A whole industry has emerged. It counts trillions of dollars today, offering funds in private assets, both in equity, in debt, and importantly also in real assets, which is one of the benefits of, of, of private assets. You can access real estate, natural resources, and important infrastructure, which was also referenced by Panos. And infrastructure is probably the top priority for a lot of pension funds today. Why? Because it offers the holy grail of an allocator, which is predictable cash flows and a yield pickup compared to public markets. And I thought I would share here a picture of Highway 401 in Toronto, Canada. This is the very first uh, infrastructure investment made by an occupational pension fund uh, 40 years ago, the Caisse de Pension de Quebec, 
the state pension fund of Quebec made that investment and it's been paying off very nicely ever, ever since. Now, moving on to uh, the second priority, which is uh, environmental, social and governance considerations integrated in portfolios. Now, what does this mean? Um, this is what I'd like to, to answer very quickly uh, by showing the evolution of the interpretation of this term, ESG investing, sometimes also called sustainable investing. Initially, about 20 years ago, it was just about excluding uh, issuers who had questionable environmental or social practices, child labor or pollution. And this was under the pressure, particularly at public pension funds of stakeholders. It evolved about 10 years ago into rating companies according to this ESG uh, criteria, uh, and sometimes even engaging into the dialogue. And the objective being to adjust portfolios according to these ratings. Most recently, about two years ago, uh, thematic uh, investing has emerged as a very promising trend, which means identifying specific themes uh, in the ESG space and then building portfolios around those themes to address those themes. And the framework to do that, uh, that is accepted today is the UN Sustainable Development Goal Framework shown on the right of this slide, which includes uh, key objectives such as clean water, such as uh, uh, decent work and economic growth, infrastructure development and industry, and importantly, goal number 13 in dark green climate action. And climate action within thematic investment is today the top priority for pension fund worldwide. Why is that? Why would you do that? Um, it is because of two reasons. Uh, one is the data that's shown on this slide. There's a flood of money predicted to go into decarbonization of major industries, uh, ranging from fuels, electricity networks, road, rail, airport, water, telecom, all these big carbon producers. And the result of that flood of money, just to give you an order of magnitude, is that the typical capital investment, aggregate capital investment of the order of four trillion, could increase by 50% to so that's the annual rate, could increase by 50% to 100% over the next 10 to 20 years. So a very significant amount of money coming in. And why is this attractive? The second reason is really George Scalopoulos put it best uh, when he wrote a few weeks ago, he wrote, climate change risk is complex because it has many dimensions, physical risks and transition risks. Modeling them is a non-trivial task, yet very important especially for long-term investors like pension funds. And of course, what George describes here is the ideal scenario for long-term investors. There's a flood of money going in. It's very complex to model. And if you can get it right, you can achieve significant overperformance. And so therefore help contribute that return gap that practitioners are faced with. Uh, is this working? Uh, absolutely. There is evidence that it is working already now. Uh, on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see that uh, in the first quarter of 2020, in the coronavirus crisis, ESG leaders, so those rated best, outperformed significantly laggards. Data from Hyman's Robertson here shows 15% plus for equities, 5% plus for bonds. Again, the kind of overperformance you need to address that return gap. Importantly, this is not new. It's been going on over a rolling three-year basis we started to see evidence of that since 2018. Very interesting because three years before 2018 is 2015. And what happened in 2015, COP21. And so we're seeing industry uh, evidence here that the market is started to integrate evidence that COP21 is having an impact and integrating that into valuation. Uh, the trend is accelerating. Again, from the survey that was discussed last December at the IFFR seminar, 50% of allocators of occupational pension funds have more than 30% of their portfolio in ESG strategies. 82% said this would increase and there's significant pressure to do that from governments, particularly the UK, which is ahead of that. I look forward very much to hearing from Ian Murray, who's been a global thought leader in that area at the follow-up session of our seminar uh, tomorrow. Now, uh, the third uh, tool to address the pension gap, the return gap, excuse me, is uh, factor investing or sometime going, uh, that I like to call dynamic asset allocation. Why does that promise to help bridge that return gap? 
uh, it's really going back to what Markowitz said 70 years ago. Uh, all of those of you that went through an Investments 101 class, recall the graphic on the left, Markowitz said you identify an efficient portfolio, and then if you need to achieve high returns, well, you just lever it up, right? Who does that today? Almost nobody. And nobody needed to do this just because the performance of efficient portfolios was just so high, right? Well, as the industry is looking at additional tools uh, to bridge the return gap, for the last 10 years, we've seen now implementations at leading pension funds of strategies that manage the overall exposure, the leverage, if you will, of the portfolio. And this leads to results such as on the right, which is a real life uh, result and shows the exposure of a portfolio that manages actively both the composition of the assets, the various color lines, and the overall exposure on the vertical axis. So a portfolio of 100 euros can behave as if it had only 50 or more than three or, or more than 200 euros, depending on market conditions. This can deliver both overperformance and risk control, but it requires a step function increase in sophistication, tools like dynamic risk allocation, access to alternative risk premia, systematic models, increasingly artificial intelligence, such as the Cortex effort in Switzerland. Uh, this is a fascinating area, one that I, I have been active in, and I'm delighted that tomorrow, very much looking forward to uh, Nick Baltas' uh, expose on this topic, uh, because he's really been involved uh, in terms of thought leadership uh, wor 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 worldwide. So three exciting areas that uh, come, came up in the survey. I'd like to add two, cost management. Uh, data on cost is difficult to find, but uh, I found here some from the Swiss space uh, showing that in 2010, uh, the mean uh, management fee for pension funds was 56 basis points. Now you can argue this is about acceptable if your expected return is in the order of five and a half to six percent. It's not acceptable anymore when the expected return is less than half that. And that realization has led to significant compression of fees with the average having come down to 44%, so 20% reduction. But it's important to note that the large players today are bidding out public uh, traded securities mandates at prices that are in the single digit basis points. The most extreme is Sweden, where mandates are bid at zero. And the only thing that is negotiated is the uh, return from securities lending. So this trend clearly will continue. Uh, finally, governance that Panos mentioned. Uh, well, governance means the way decisions are taken. And increasingly, this is being identified as a source of overperformance. Uh, the gentleman of the left is uh, Mats Langenhoe. He advised uh, twice over the last 15 years the Swedish government on redesigning the selection of funds. And he wrote in his last report, uh, the quote here on the upper left, the Canadian model will in the end deliver governance alpha if applied to Sweden. What did he mean? He meant if, that if in Sweden we take decisions as in Canada, we will get overperformance. Why? Because there's clear evidence that Canadian pension funds, uh, which have adopted a model, a common model for taking decisions, have delivered overperformance. What is that model? Uh, it's been delivered by the gentleman of the right, Professor Keith Ambachtir, uh, who has de devised that five element model that focuses particularly on mission clarity and on scale. And I've had the uh, honor of uh, discussing with Professor Rambachir at the seminar, how to apply his learnings to the Swiss system to improve performance. Uh, in Europe, a uh, very interesting concept is the governance budget concept developed by Professor Gordon Clark at Oxford University. Uh, and a uh, very practical concept, and I've worked with Professor Clark to improve governance at a number of pension funds by applying his, his learning. Now, uh, all these are very exciting developments. However, uh, as you can see, there's a level of complexity uh, to applying them. And so there are clear implementation challenges for practitioners and for occupational pension funds. The breadth of skill needs to increase, the sophistication needs to increase, the scale becomes more and more important. And today, even some of the largest pension funds are coming to the realization that they cannot get a loan to the level of breadth and sophistication and scale that is needed 
to capture all these overperformance opportunities. And what we're seeing is a very interesting trend is collaboration. Collaboration between pension funds on the global cases, collaboration with industry, collaboration between public and private capital. And I put here three examples uh, from Canada, the US, and, and, and Switzerland in this case, but there are many, many more. And this is an emerging, uh, an, a very interesting emerging trend. So in conclusion, uh, it's a very exciting time uh, to be building portfolios. A number of new models are emerging on how to approach portfolio construction. Uh, for example, on the top left, the scenario-based dynamic asset allocation model championed by Ortec in the Netherlands. On the top right, the matching plus model increasingly being applied in the UK that separates between pure growth and matching assets. Risk-based multi-asset allocation, we'll hear from Nick Baltas tomorrow about this. And uh, one of my favorite, one of my research interests, which has been time horizon uh, structure for constructing portfolios. All of these trying to integrate, of course, ESG sustainability and considerations with an objectives of 100% ESG, which is today a benchmark for many, many occupational pension plans. So I hope this introduction uh, gave you a flavor for where the industry is today, why it's a very exciting time uh, to be involved in that. And I very much look forward to hearing from our other speakers and discussing this uh, with everybody uh, during the rest of the seminar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Econo, for, uh, for this uh, very, very interesting and inspiring, I will say, talk. Uh, I would like to remind you, the audience, that uh, we can all, you can all write your questions to Mr. Economo and uh, to all the uh, speakers uh, at uh, the chat option in uh, the Zoom. And we will address them all at uh, the end of uh, the talks after the all, all talks uh, have finished. So the, so the second speaker uh, of uh, today's session is uh, Dr. David McCarthy, assistant professor at the University of Georgia in the United States. Uh, Dr. McCarthy holds a PhD from the Wharton University, uh, Wharton School of uh, the University of uh, the University of Pennsylvania, and before joining uh, University of Georgia. He worked at, uh, at the University of Oxford and Imperial College. Uh, his academic research has focused on various, uh, various aspects of pension funds, including occupational pension design, pension insurance, and pension investments. He, also, uh, he has also uh, cons consulted uh, on the pension policy uh, for various, um, various uh, uh, governments, including the UK and more recently South Africa, where he advised uh, on several issues ranging from taxation to patient design and regulation. Uh, today, Dr. Uh, McCarthy uh, will talk uh, about, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, international uh, developments in the regulation of the investment in DC patient plans. Uh, Dr. McCarthy, go ahead. You have about 20 minutes still. Great, thank you, thank you, Mikhail, and, and greetings to everybody from another Athens. Uh, this is Athens, Georgia, in the United States. It's slightly less glamorous than uh, Athens, Greece. Um, so, before we talk about uh, you know investment regulation, the important thing is to try and uh, understand exactly what it is that we're trying to achieve. Um, and so, I thought I would lay out what the principles and goals of investment regulation are. And the primary principle of investment regulation, and it's laid out in, in IOP, which is the EU Directive on Occupational Pension Plans, um, but it's also uh, well expressed in the Cooper Report uh, issued by the Australian Treasury in 2015. Um, and the primary principle is that pension system assets must be invested solely for the benefit of members, right? And what does this mean? Well, it means it, 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 it it, it's best to look at this in the context of, of, of what pension assets are not there for, okay? And firstly, they're not there to provide support for intermediaries, whether these intermediaries are asset managers, financial advisors, brokers, or others, or to provide a cheap source of capital. And they're not there to support public policy objectives, however worthy these may be. And in, in my time at the Treasury in South Africa, I saw uh, attempts to use pension fund assets for infrastructure, attempts to use it for greening the economy, uh, attempts to use them for uh, supporting government finances. And across the, develop, the developing world in particular, um, there've been attempts to use pension fund assets to develop the financial system. 
Now, why is this principle important? The principle is important um, because it, it, it is essential that members contributing to the pension system have confidence that their assets are being used um, for their benefit and for their benefit alone, right? The primary goals of um, uh, regulation are two. Um, the first one is to ensure efficiency, right? And there are, there are two types of efficiency. Uh, the first type of efficiency is from the point of view of members, and that is a really appropriate asset allocation of individual members. Um, and the previous speaker spoke a lot about portfolio theory. So that is kind of making sure that the assets that individuals hold are appropriately allocated between the different securities for their needs. Um, the second type of efficiency is cost-effective financial intermediation. So one of the uh, goals of the, one of the, the purposes of the pension system is to match uh, those people who are saving uh, to those people who need capital, i.e. Who are, who are borrowing. And so cost-effective financial in intermediation means that the investment returns of, of the underlying assets, uh, the, the borrowers, if you will, are, are channeled in a cost-effective way uh, to the people whose money it is. And why is this important? Well, because we don't want too much of the uh, benefits of these investments to be wasted by fees and expenses. Um, and also we want to lower the cost of capital um, for societal benefits. So the less efficient financial intermediation is, the higher the cost of capital of the society and the fewer investment projects um, can be financed. So that's the first goal of investment regulation. The second goal of investment regulation is, is protection. So, you know, we, we need to ensure that in, in members' assets are not wasted, uh, they're not um, uh, defrauded or, or people don't abscond with them. Um, this has two purposes, again, to ensure confidence of the members that they are, they are saving. Uh, and, and, you know, fundamentally, any form of saving is, a, is, an, is an act of trust. Um, you know, you're foregoing consumption today in order to enjoy the benefits of, of consumption in the future. The greater confidence members have that they will, will in fact enjoy the returns in the future, uh, the more likely they are to save um, in the present. So, you know, if you look at a schema of investment regulation in DC pension schemes, I've just drawn, it looks like a very complex diagram, but really what it does is it, it tracks the flow of delegation down, uh, the, down the whole uh, intermediation chain. And it starts with individual members over here. And I've put employers and financial advisors there because in, in occupational schemes, uh, there's a triangular membership between the triangular relationship um, between the pension fund, the employer and the member. And financial advisors also have some kind of relationship between uh, the, with the uh, individual members and with the pension funds. Uh, in some systems, individual members uh, don't invest through pension schemes. They might go directly to portfolios. Um, in others, they may go directly to capital markets. Um, but in most systems, they go through pension funds. These horizontal lines indicate at least partial reliance of the regulator on market discipline. So what is market discipline? It's the ability of individual members to choose pension funds that suit their needs. So if you have a pension fund that is, is not doing the right thing, um, it's inefficient, it's not well governed, um, then one protection that regulators can give to individuals is to give them the right to switch their money from one pension fund to another. Now, in occupational systems, in many cases, not in all cases, for instance, in Australia, you, you are free to switch your uh, superannuation scheme from, from one fund to another. In other systems, occupational schemes, are, are you don't have fund choice. So I've given that line there a bit of a, a, a kind of a, a transparent um, line to indicate that the market discipline on pension funds is not as strong as it is in other cases. Pension funds invest through asset managers. Um, in some cases, uh, you can invest through insurance companies or banks, but in, in most cases, it's through asset managers. And again, you know, regulators and individuals and pension funds rely on a competitive market between uh, different asset managers. So I put that line horizontally to provide them with some protection so that they can then uh, switch their money um, from, from funds that are, that are not performing or funds that are expensive um, uh, or inefficient uh, to other funds. Then, you know, these all buy and sell securities and they buy and sell securities in the capital market. And again, the capital market provides some degree of protection 
in the sense that securities are priced in a way that reflects the underlying risks of those securities, right? And you know, the, the, the previous speaker mentioned the importance of unlisted assets. Um, and of course, we always need to remember that there's a, a positive relationship between risk and return. And if unlisted assets have higher expected returns, um, in, in, if we believe that capital is being efficiently allocated in the economy, one of the reasons must be higher risks. Um, and the question there is, what role does the capital market play? Well, one important role of public assets rather than private assets is that prices are observable. Um, and one of the challenges associated with investment in private assets is that prices are not as transparent and that creates room for malfeasance and, and could reduce the confidence of that individual savers have in the system. So if we, if we plot the, 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 the path of profits in the reverse direction, this is what we see. So we see the underlying profits of, of, of businesses. And of course, there are costs of corporate governance. The worse corporate governance is, the higher the capital returns expected by investors and the, the, the fewer projects can be financed by existing capital. Um, there are costs of market inefficiency. Um, there are trading costs. Then asset managers take their take due to management fees. Pension funds have their piece due to admin and advice fees. And before we, we think about the benefits for members, we have to remember the costs of portfolio inefficiency. And so one of the tasks of, of uh, investment regulation is to try and, and ensure that the, 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 the benefits for, for members are as large as possible, a, a piece of this underlying pie, um, taking into account all of these costs, right? And so what are the main tools of, of regulators? Well, the first tool I've called other regulation, and this is like really the basic plumbing of uh, financial markets. It includes tax law, which, which impacts pretty much every level of the structure. Um, it includes corporate uh, law. So, you know, laws protecting minority shareholders, et cetera. It includes capital market regulation, such as MIFID. Um, and then I've called market structure regulation. So the previous speaker again mentioned Sweden. Um, so and New Zealand is another example where auctions are held uh, for um, between different providers to try and get the best possible price. Um, that's an example of market structure. Another example of market structure is to get members to compete uh, to, with different pension funds. So basically allocating members to pension funds based on, on price. That's another example of market structure regulation. Recent trends in, in international in, uh, regulation have split uh, regulation into two pieces. First, there's what's called market conduct regulation. And market conduct regulation really uh, tries to uh, limit the uh, discretion that people have in terms of how they interact with their clients, whoever these are. So market conduct regulation, uh, as far as individual members are concerned, regulates the provision of financial advice. Um, for pension funds, it, it encompasses things such as investment defaults, um, fiduciary rules, uh, disclosure rules, in this case to members, bundling of different services. So recently in the UK, for instance, they've mandated that um, investment management, um, administration and financial advice be unbundled, uh, charges um, separated for those so that people can see exactly what they're paying for. Um, there is some examples of product regulation in terms of charge caps. Um, in many cases, about uh, 12 of the 20 largest uh, countries in the OECD have some form of charge cap. Um, in some cases, these caps are set at zero, which basically means that some types of charges have been um, uh, outlawed. Uh, very similar rules apply to asset managers, insurers, and banks, so I won't talk to those. The other type of regulation in investments is prudential regulation. As I said, the trend is to try and split these up. So uh, this started in Australia, um, where they split the market conduct regulation and the prudential regulation into two pieces. Um, the UK has followed suit. Um, South Africa has now also followed suit. What is prudential regulation? Well, you know, it deals with things such as licensing, so that's fit and proper uh, requirements. Um, it deals with eligible products and securities, so what products and securities may uh, pension funds or individual members invest in, in their pension funds. The prudent person rule, um, which is very important, also part of um, IOR. Uh, quantitative limits, if any, on different kinds of securities, and some of these are intended to ensure uh, sufficient diversification and to prevent uh, ex excess concentration of securities. 
Um, ESG rules, and I note that in IOF, ESG rules are uh, explicitly subordinate um, to the first principle of investment regulation, which is that, as I said, uh, the, invest the assets are to be invested for the sole benefit of members, um, and then for prohibitions on borrowing. So that's sort of a broad schema of, of modern trends in investment regulation. Um, the previous speaker mentioned uh, the in investment costs, and this is really uh, e efficiency of intermediation. Um, I never talk about this issue without putting this slide up. Um, what the slide shows is the effect of costs on benefit accumulation. And I've assumed a 4% per annum real return as the previous speaker pointed out, um, that may be slightly on the, on the ambitious side. But what this graph shows is it shows that the, the effect of annual costs on the proportion of the returns that accrue to investors rather than to intermediaries. Um, and you can see that, and I've put um, various uh, figures over here. So these, where I've put a date, those figures come from an OECD measure uh, survey on investment returns. And you can see in Turkey, for instance, average investment returns are about 200 basis points a year. And what that means is that roughly two thirds of the returns um, on, on investment are lost to intermediaries in the form of expenses. Um, and clearly that is, that is too high. Um, if you move to the left, uh, Spain, the average return is about 110 basis points a year. Here, that means that about 25% or so of returns are lost to expenses. Um, the UK default uh, charge cap is 75 basis points. Uh, the average Australian scheme these days is sitting at about 50 basis points. Um, and as the previous speaker mentioned, large, uh, well-run plans, not only in the US, but in other places are sitting here at roughly five basis points. So this is a very, very important to understand why it is um, that regulators are very concerned about, um, about fees and the general push is to push these fees downwards, right? And so now when we, when we measure these costs, we need to be very, very careful because what we're actually measuring is only efficiency of intermediation, firstly. And secondly, it's only a piece of the efficiency of, of intermediation. And why do I say that? If I go back to this slide, we're very, very good at measuring costs from this level upwards. Um, costs in this level, okay, and some of the costs over here, that is insurers and banks, excuse me, insurers and banks, uh, we're very, very bad at, at measuring. And I'll, I'll, I'll give some examples of, of, of what this means. So um, firstly, trading costs are largely unknown and or unrecorded. And one of the strongest, in my mind, uh, arguments in favor of index investing is that it, is that it gives you the ability to measure uh, the extent to which your manager is relying on trading costs for, um, or uh, exposing you to trading costs. Because what you can do is you can compare the performance of your fund uh, with the performance of, of the index, and that gives you a reasonable measure of trading costs. But in the case of active management um, or more sophisticated products, there is no way that, the, the, that we have of measuring those um, trading costs. ETFs are, are you know, um, those are exchange traded funds. What those do is those move some of the expenses out of measurable portions. So, you know, in terms of admin and advice fees and management fees, and they move it onto the unmeasurable portion, which is trading costs. And so although ETFs look, may look cheaper, it's not obvious at all that they are cheaper from the point of view of members. Um, structured products and insurance policies. Um, so some of these are, um, you know, uh, derivatives, um, insurance policies, etc. What these do is these embed these expenses in returns. So in fact, they never enter into our calculations at all, and they certainly don't enter into these uh, measures of of efficiency. And the final point I want to emphasize is that the costs of portfolio inefficiency are ignored. So what are the costs to members of having a portfolio that is uh, not suitable for them? And of course, one of the downsides of this drive towards lower um, in efficiency of intermediation, you know, is putting people into more standardized portfolios. And the extent to which that comes at the cost of greater portfolio in inefficiency to members is as yet, I think, uh, completely unknown. Um, so what are current trends in investment regulation? Um, well, 
Many regulators are attempting to foster competition, as I said, um, to increase market discipline, right? Um, and that ha happens both at the pension fund level and at the service provider level. So there's competition between pension funds for members. There's competition between service providers uh, for members. And this requires you know, greater disclosure, greater transparency, greater portability, okay? Prohibitions on bundling and rebates, such as in the UK, um, and in some cases, product regulation, as I, as I described. Um, there's a greater reliance on defaults and trying to ensure that these are appropriate rather than relying on individual financial advice. I'll return to this in the next slide. Um, one of the movements uh, recently is to move away from one size fits all defaults um, to what are called conditional defaults. And conditional defaults are defaults that depend in some way on the circumstances of the individual member. So the, the classic example of these is life cycle or target date funds where individuals are allocated to a default based on their likely retirement date. Another example might be a default that depends on the balance of the individual in the fund. So individuals with larger balances might be allocated to a different default than individuals with smaller balances. Um, another example might be salary. So individuals with higher salaries might be um, allocated to different defaults to individuals uh, with lower salaries. Um, so many of the more modern investment regulations do explicitly allow for uh, conditional defaults. And then of course, there's greater capital market efficiency. And again, one of the risks associated with unlisted assets is that you are no longer given the protection as a member that capital markets give you in terms of pricing, in terms of observability. Um, and instead you rely on a black box um, run by a fund manager who with the best will in the world is, is, is deeply conflicted. And so um, the costs of, um, of unlisted assets uh, should be looked at quite carefully. So um, where do I think this is going in the next five or 10 years? Well, um, I think there's going to be a, a, a big challenge associated with the rise of structured products. As I said, one of the unintended consequences of regulators drive for efficiency is to, is to, is to give uh, product providers an incentive to try and structure, uh, create structured products that embed charges in returns. And, and this makes it extremely hard to measure the efficiency of intermediation and very, very difficult to compare with other products, um, which of course hampers the uh, efficiency of the market and reduces the protection that investors have uh, that is provided by their ability to switch from one product to another. The second is the rise of ETFs, which as I said, shift expenses out of the fund. Um, so in a standard mutual fund, you know, the, the mutual fund charges include uh, you know, the, the cost of market making. Um, in ETFs, the cost of market making is not included in the fund in the expenses that you see. And instead it falls into the trading costs, which are very, very hard uh, to measure, particularly in, in the case of active management. There's a difficult question about how to regulate non-traditional investments, um, such as infrastructure. So the OECD has been driving a push to, um, to try and make uh, make it easier for pension funds to invest in, in infrastructure. Um, but how these investments should be regulated uh, is a very, very difficult question. Uh, how to ensure portfolio efficiency and indeed how to quantify portfolio e efficiency. Um, my view is that regulators should not take a view on, on which side of, of, of the, the fence they fall on. On the one hand, um, investment advisors and whether these go through individual investment advice or they go through robo advice, um, you know, they claim that their, their advantage is that they are closer to the client and they know more about the client. Um, asset managers claim that they know more about financial markets uh, than investment advisors. And, and both of those things are true. Um, what this creates is a, is, a, is a war for fees between these two groups of, 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 uh, of intermediaries. Um, and as I said, I don't think um, regulators should take a view, um, but I do think they should try and strive to ensure a level playing field um, in terms of outcomes between these two um, groups of, of people trying to ensure portfolio efficiency. And the final um, uh, development in the next five or 10 years is regulating the decumulation or payout phase. Um, and so some countries, South Africa uh, has implemented a, a, a default regulation on annuitization. Um, the UK has, uh, is just now starting a, 
regulation on the path towards the payout phase. Um, but as the demographic challenges rise and as more people reach the decumulation phase, um, this issue is going to become ever more prominent. And so I will stop there and I look forward to um, receiving your questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. McCarthy, for, uh, uh, for this interesting, very, very interesting talk. And uh, of course that you paid it in uh, 20 minutes. Uh, let's uh, go to the last talk of this today's session is by Dimitrios uh, Zafiris. Mr. Zafiris is the, is the head of the risk and financial stability department of the European, uh, of the European Insurance and Occupational Patients Authority known as EOPA and is responsible for um, its activities in the areas of financial stability, crisis management and uh, studies and statistics. Uh, before joining uh, AIOPA, uh, Mr. Zafiris uh, ran the risk, uh, risk management uh, unit in uh, ProBank in Greece, where he was uh, responsible, uh, among others, for uh, the implementation of uh, Basel II and uh, the external asset uh, quality reviews. He also has a, a, a extensive experience in asset management since he has worked uh, as an ins investment uh, advisor and portfolio manager for many years in several uh, firms. And uh, he will uh, speak today about uh, risks and asset allocation of European pension funds. Uh, Mr. Zafiris, you have also about 30 minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Mikhail, and thanks all for the introduction. And of course, thanks for the invite and the chance to uh, be part of this uh, event today. He listen to uh, uh, the very interesting uh, introductions that we had already and also have the chance to present AOPA's view. AOPA's view when it comes to risks, uh, risks perhaps discussing risk is not the most popular item and or perhaps is not what people want to hear about. Nonetheless, it's always necessary as it sometimes it may serve as a flip side of uh, things. Now, what we try to, to do, we try to pick the most uh, relevant uh, risks uh, to discuss. Uh, the most relevant being the most relevant for uh, IOPS uh, sector, especially making the link to today's uh, market conditions. So uh, starting from the macro environment, uh, perhaps one can easily observe that the impact uh, of the crisis as, as it stands uh, today, let's not forget that we, uh, most of us are speaking to each other through our living rooms today. So yeah, indeed, we are in uh, extraordinary conditions. Uh, and these extraordinary conditions, of course, of course, took the toll on the growth of the economy. Uh, may, perhaps if you want to focus in the European economy, we will have an impact in a decrease of the GDP in the area of uh, between 6 and 7% expected to recover in 2021. But this recovery, of course, is fully uh, related to the extent that this second wave uh, will uh, be prolonged or not. Let's not all uh, forget that very recently, the president of the ECB made a clear link between the timing of uh, reopening the economies and the validity of today's predictions when it comes to GDP growth in 2021 and going uh, forward. Uh, of course, the, the, let's say the decrease of GDP is not just a, a number that we all monitor. It has effects in real life. It has an effect on unemployment rate, for example, what we present for you today. And we all know what the link is of between uh, employment and unemployment and pension contribution is uh, like in today's uh, economy. At the right hand side, what we brought for you, again, at a, trying to bring at a glance, uh, the market situation today is uh, some uh, market uh, ratios, some market performance ratios. Now, uh, what, uh, what one can easily observe is that after the initial shock, after the, the shock, especially in, the, in March 2020, we, we had decrease in equity values, sometimes in excess of uh, 30% across the globe. Markets have fully recovered. In some parts of the globe, uh, we are now at levels higher than the pre-crisis uh, levels. Um, you can see in the US, uh, for example, the current uh, prices are higher than they were before the beginning of the crisis. Europe is also falling in close uh, steps. And if you look at the right hand side that we have a bit of a more short term uh, horizon, uh, looking at the uh, valuations and at current market performance, you will see strong double digit uh, performance when it comes to the major European indices. Uh, banks perhaps uh, underperforming in specific uh, extent, usually for good uh, reasons, uh, especially when it comes to the cost of equity and the potential for increase in NPLs. But nonetheless, we see a, a very strong market uh, performance. Now, why would this be a thing 
that somebody would discuss in the area of risks rather than to discuss the positive side of it. Well, at one side, we all know that uh, most of this positive impact, or at least part of this uh, positive impact, can be attributed to the uh, support measures currently in place, fiscal on the fiscal side, but also on the monetary side. So discussing on the fiscal side, uh, one would wonder uh, what would be the impact and what would be the magnitude in the increased deficit of these support measures. But of course, perhaps most importantly, what would be the fading out of these measures? With a few words, what happens when all these support measures, uh, payment holidays, payment loan holidays, etc., what would be the impact when these are fading out? What's the timing of these uh, fading out measures, uh, etc.? So this is a question mark. And the second question mark perhaps would be uh, how rational it is, what the, uh, and is the, our market still closely linked to macroeconomic variables when we see the impact that we have observed in the economy, but nonetheless, we see in some parts of uh, the world that the market valuations are even higher than they were at the pre-crisis levels. So is there a lost link between macroeconomic fundamentals and market performance? So that's a question mark and perhaps a risk going ahead. Uh, other elements that we brought that they link at least to the IROP sector is on the on one side, the, what we have here, the swap curve. Uh, swap curve, as a, a, of course, in a, uh, in a way, it serves to value your liabilities going forward. It's one of the measures to discount liabilities at the risk-free rate. One can easily observe that uh, risk-free curves are on the declining mode for some path now. What may seem, and that perhaps it fools the eye, as Q1 2019 as a curve quite high, it's still not high. It's much, much lower than perhaps what we have been discussing in 2015, when it was the first time that the market analysts were discussing the low yield environment. But what we can see now is a swap curve that is at the biggest part of, well, let's say, most of the tenors on the negative side. And this definitely has an impact on valuing your future liability. Of course, current uh, levels of uh, risk, the low yield environment that was also mentioned by the previous speakers, uh, does not only refer to the, to the liability side, it also refers to the asset side. Well, being more explicit, perhaps on the income side. What we have here as a chart is the history of the 10 year government bond yields. It doesn't take much to notice the, the, the declining path. It doesn't take much to notice the negative area for most of the yields. But what also we must not forget is that when we discuss returns, uh, and I think it was mentioned before from other speakers, the positive returns uh, witnessed in the past, what we have ahead of us is the negative side, perhaps, of these uh, positive returns witnessed in the past. Because with declining yields, we had, of course, a good uh, amount of capital gains on the fixed income uh, side, capital gains that they did offer returns to investors already, indeed, yes. But going forward, uh, when one has to discount future income at the current yield level, we can all see that the things are uh, not very easily managed when it comes to the future uh, income stream. So let's say the, the past returns that we keep on saying is not perhaps a good indication for the future returns. So perhaps if one was to summarize, to summarize the impact of the current yield, of the current uh, market conditions, uh, of course, I'm not going to go through reading each of these uh, bullet points, but we could highlight a couple of uh, items. Uh, as I mentioned before, our equity markets especially, they seem to have uh, recovered. But again, there, there is a lot of risk going forward. One side would be what, is the what would be the impact on credit deterioration, the credit deterioration that may occur due to the economic crisis to several sectors of the economy. This may have an impact, of course, on equity. Uh, prices. It may have an impact, of course, on corporate bond prices, especially if we are talking about uh, credit rating downgrades uh, going forward. Um, of course, the impact is not uniform. We have different asset allocations across Europe. We have different types of risk across Europe. We have different types of risk within portfolios uh, sometimes. Uh, this is an area for asset managers and supervisors alike to look uh, into. Nonetheless, of course, and again, uh, just to adjust the environment to the sector. We are talking about the pension funds, we're talking about IOPS, that they have long-term obligations, so short-term volatility, uh, market volatility, is not necessarily at the same concern as it would be, for example, for other financial institutions like uh, banks. Nonetheless, uh, structural uh, events, that uh, events that they may persist in the long run, are also a source of concern for the IOPS sector going uh, forward. 
Uh, and again, what uh, is a question for the whole economy and for the whole financial sector is uh, trying to maintain what we have today, because what we have today that must not neglect, neglect is still a macroeconomic crisis, not a financial crisis. All the measures uh, currently in place manage to safeguard the financial uh, industry, be it the bank, being insured, but also being pension funds. And in order to maintain that, it's also important to see the timing and the magnitude of alleviating the current uh, measures. Because as I mentioned before, part of what we see today is the outcome of support measures at the fiscal and the monetary side. Let's not forget there are, it's a good amount of uh, billions, if not trillions, in the market from central banks purchasing right now government and corporate bonds. So a lot of the returns already witnessed is the outcome of this type of interventions uh, in order to support uh, the market. And of course, we need to see what the outlook would be going forward. So what is one of the potential channels that this type of risks fit, risks fit into uh, the IR sector as it is today? Well, the most obvious one on the asset side is, of course, the portfolio allocation of uh, IRs. Uh, it is also within the title of uh, our uh, presentation today, the portfolio, the portfolio allocation of uh, the sector. Now, looking at the EU level, one can easily observe that, let's say, the, the bulk of uh, the assets is mainly invested in uh, fixed income, uh, let's say in bonds and fixed income assets and what we call usage and in mutual funds and in funds and of course a good uh, double strong double digit figure around 20 percent is invested in equity of course this is not uh, you know average on average we're all healthy meaning that on average the figures can be sometimes uh, misleading when we can look from uh, we're looking from country to country and by definition, of course, from fund to fund, one will observe significant uh, differences. Looking at our uh, digital home country, Greece, one can see also a bit of a difference when comparing to the EU averages with a, a greater bulk of uh, uh, the asset side being investment in usage. Uh, what I would like to point out here uh, is that we do have much more information than that. Let's say IROP sector was on the sector that when compared to banking and insurance, uh, kind of lagged behind when it comes to supervisor information, the information that the supervisors had at hand. This changed recently since uh, last year. There has been a, what we call a pensions data uh, initiative at the European level, close cooperation between our side, uh, national authorities, and of course the cent European Central Bank. We are now receiving much more granular uh, information that we will be able to start presenting to the public. We'll uh, also start publishing statistics gradually based on this uh, information, just to give you let's say some uh, additional insights into that uh, what you see today here as usage we are of course able gradually to uh, be able to differentiate between different types of funds we are able to see whether they are equity bond or uh, even uh, balanced funds but even more than that uh, we are able to apply a look-through approach we will be able to receive as we do already for the insurance uh, sector what we call asset by asset uh, template so at least for the big IROPs, we will be able to have each individual security to the ISIN level that they hold. And this will be, of course, very useful to make uh, types of uh, analysis and uh, some uh, perhaps uh, uh, predictions for uh, vulnerabilities in the future. So what do we do as we stand today, trying to see whether uh, what's the vulnerability of the sector? Because risk in itself is not necessarily a bad thing. You can take, uh, of course, because at the end of the day, what matters is first your risk bearing capacity, your risk management capability, and of course, as long as everything is done in a good risk return context. What we try to do at the supervisory side is to assess vulnerabilities. One of the ways of doing so is through stress testing. Stress testing, we tried to do it and it was quite uh, unique, uh, perhaps globally, we did it for the first time in 2015. Then we repeated the stress testing exercise every couple of years. Now we'll do it every three years for IOPS uh, sector. I'll now give you a, a couple of more details on how we have done it in 2019 and what we plan to do going forward. Uh, 2019, what we wanted to see uh, it's the, what's the impact on assets, on adverse market uh, developments, the uh, impact of members, beneficiary, and on sponsors. Why? Because especially on the DB part of what we say, the divine, divine, defined benefit part, uh, we have some the, the impact there because of the current pension gap, and the pension gap can, that can grow under adverse, under adverse market conditions. Uh, there is usually, and then the different uh, 
perhaps taking into consideration that there are different frameworks in place from country to country. There is what we call this, the obligation of the sponsor perhaps to tip in in the defined benefit uh, context. And there we wanted to see also the impact on sponsor because this was a direct impact on financial stability and the real uh, economy. So these are areas that we have been uh, look, uh, looking into. For the first time in 2019, we had the first look at the, what we call the ESG risk, so ESG-related exposures in the portfolios of uh, pension funds. And how we try to, the, but for the ESG part, it was not part of the exercise, it's more of a stock take like, rather than a vulnerability exercise, this will come in the future. What we try to see is the impact of the current uh, asset side based on some adverse market situations. Uh, how we design the, the shock, how do we design the stress scenario. We do this in collaboration with the ESRB and ECB. So we have the, the modeling expertise from our colleagues in the European Central Bank, which is the same modeling the techniques used to do the banking stress testing, also the insurance stress testing. So we use the same, uh, perhaps uh, the same model. We adjust it, of course, on the portfolio of IROPS, but we use the same techniques when it comes to picking a severity level and picking a specific shock that will uh, stress different asset classes with a, uh, as we would like to call it, adverse but plausible, uh, plausible uh, scenario. When it comes to the results of 2019, first of all, even at the baseline, uh, we did witness that uh, perhaps with differences from country to country, it's not across the union, the vulnerability is the same, but even in the baseline scenario, so even at the press, pre-stress scenario, there is what we call some, uh, there is sometimes a pension gap. There is already what we call a difference between the current value of assets and the, and the current value of future liabilities. This can be even more extended when it comes to adverse uh, market conditions. Nonetheless, and we can only repeat that as many times as we have to, IOPS is not the same as a financial institution. IOPS has long-term uh, liability. It's not the same as a bank that has to meet its liabilities on site. So it has the time to enter into a recovery plan and be able to meet future liabilities. Assumer, assuming, of course, a mean reversion, assuming, of course, markets uh, recover, and assuming also uh, sponsor support when there are financial promises made. What we would uh, like to see, presenting it in uh, numbers perhaps, and just at a glance for you, uh, when it comes on the investments, the stress scenario that we picked in 2019 was a scenario assuming increase in yields and increase in risk premium. Uh, we, the impact was in the area of 250 billion for the defined benefits sector of our sample and around the 16 billion for the defined contributions part. Uh, but when trying to put this in a GDP uh, context, we see that this was quite significant. So the loss of adverse market conditions could reach 2% of uh, gross domestic uh, product for the countries within our sample. Uh, so you, you may observe, and this is public information, of course, uh, and I invite you to look at the stress test report published at that time, a different outcome uh, according to, of course, to the portfolio allocation, ac according to the vulnerability of each uh, fund, but again, a significant uh, impact on the asset side when it comes to defined benefit. Looking at defined contributions, replacement rates, which again, they are uh, at different levels across the union, uh, according to the, the framework currently in place. Here, what we need to monitor, to notice is that unlike the, unlike the banking sector and the insurance sector that we, they have in Europe, what we call a maximum harmonization framework. This is not the case for the uh, for the pension uh, funds, where we have what we call a minimum harmonization, where we have some common principles, but each uh, national authority in each country uses their own way of measuring uh, the, the pension uh, gap, perhaps assets, liabilities, and different ways of, uh, let's say, assessing uh, both. Uh, but when it comes to stress testing, we do observe, and, and of course, and then uh, based also on common sense, uh, the higher the shock, the higher the impact would be to retirees uh, in the short term rather than the future, longer term, but still very significant when it comes to the baseline, but also to the stress uh, replacement rates. Uh, looking at the time, I have to uh, try to keep, uh, the, let's say, within the timeline. What I would like to mention here is a, a couple of more slides. Uh, we took a look at the what we call the greenhouse and the gas intensive uh, in investments. So we try to see how green or not the current portfolios of pension funds are. Still, we saw differences from country to country. But if I if I was to be short in presenting it, and again, I will invite you to 
take a look at the reports already public, what one what can easily observe is that on the equity side, the uh, portfolios are more invested, let's say, higher than average, higher than the average economy uh, on non-green investments. Uh, on the fixed income side, this is not the case. It's on the it's a bit more conservative there. So more, uh, let's say, less non-green assets on the fixed income side. And why is this uh, relevant? And why would we like to measure this? Because one point, if we look on returns, and uh, we uh, and again, we had previous speakers before, look on returns, one could see areas that they are green, etc., and they may have some potential for growth going forward. But what we also need to look into is current portfolios and what may happen to what we call non-green portfolios. What may happen to portfolios that currently in, uh, are invested in uh, entities uh, that they are, in, let's say, involved in coal, which is not part of the greening the economy. What would be the, so, the impact on the pricing and the prices of this asset, be fixed income or equity assets? And this is described of what we usually see in the literature today and when um, supervisors perhaps uh, interact is what we call transition risk so asset transition risk so what would be the, the transition transi transmitting uh, your portfolio onto a greener economy what would be the impact on the non-green assets uh, so as i said this is uh, summarizing the impact of the 2019 significant impact on the asset side uh, some ESG considerations, so we do need to look into the vulnerability of the asset side to uh, any type of transition risk, and of course uh, the call for supervisory monitoring going forward. Talking about going forward, we started doing stress tests as I mentioned already back in 2015, uh, but it's a uh, we feel that the way of doing stress tests, having a common methodology in addition to the national methodologies, uh, kind of reached the, its a maturity level. What we wanted to do uh, is to uh, develop the methodology even further. We have done this in the insurance sector. We issued the discussion papers calling for academics and the industry to contribute to stress testing methodologies for the insurance sector. This is more or less uh, finalized now. And we plan to do the same for the IROP sector as well. We are working currently in AOPA together with the national members. How it is done usually at the European side is that, of course, you have AOPA as a European institution, but then we are forming team project groups together with the national authorities, and we are working with us on a specific topic. One of these specific topics is, the, 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 let's say, improving the methodology for pension stress testing, IROP stress testing. We will soon publish something in this area, most likely at the end of the current year. And as I mentioned already, we invite input from academia, market practitioners, etc. And of course, I invite also the members of the current, uh, any of you that they are, you are currently uh, watching us today. Uh, finally, I mentioned transition risks. I mentioned uh, the impact this that it may have on the asset side. And um, as I said, we plan to uh, improve the data quality also of the pension sector. Improving it meaning, means also to a certain extent bringing it to the level we have in the insurance sector. In the insurance sector, we do have uh, asset by asset information. And we did already this sensitivity analysis on the impact of ESG risks, transition risks on the asset side of insurers at that time. Taking a glance of that uh, today, what we have done, we have picked a couple of adverse scenarios, usually induced by policy action. We went down to the IZIN level, uh, together with external co collaborators. We even uh, we also worked together with academia to see the impact on the sovereign side. We also worked with think tanks to see the impact on equities and uh, bonds. And so we tried to see different uh, scenarios, see what would be the impact on current market valuations or on the current holding of the insurance portfolio. As a reminder here to those of you who are not familiar with it, on the insurance side, we have an excess of 2,700 insurers reporting to us on an asset by asset basis, as I said. So we were able to really map a good part of this portfolio to what we call the uh, green or brown assets and what would the impact would be on the greening of the economy on different scenarios. Different scenarios, usually they relate to the timing of uh, the need to green the economy, especially to what we call the two degree uh, initiative. What was quite a novelty, what we brought is that we didn't only look at the negative side of it. So we didn't only look at sectors that they may impact negatively from this transition, from the greening of the economy, but we also had in our model also uh, parts of the finance, of the real economy that would have a favorable 
income from greening the economy. This is what you may see as this green part in this waterfall. So what we did looking at a, as a top-down exercise, we looked at our database, we looked, as I said, to specific uh, assets, specific down to the ISIN level or using NACE codes when this was not uh, possible. And then we had the, the capacity to model and equities and corporate bonds, see the impact and see the overall impact of the industry when it comes to bringing the economy. Something similar we plan to do in the future uh, also for the IROP sector. And this perhaps uh, concludes what I mentioned to you uh, that there are many elements, many different elements one has to consider, ranging from financial risk to non so financial risk, not only looking at the positive uh, side of things. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So what's uh, uh, Mr. Zafiris for uh, this uh, really, really uh, a nice talk. Uh, we learned a lot of things uh, and I, I really believe that uh, uh, this uh, stress test for for this uh, uh, field is super important and has to be taken into account for every everyone that is involved in this. Uh, so it's a time for a Q and A. Uh, yeah, I think we can uh, move on with the Q and A uh, with the audience. I mean, the all talks were really interesting. I mean, I, I got really shocked in a way by the very last results that uh, Dimitri Zafiri showed to us regarding the results you know, from the stress test. I mean, you have a really significant loss if things go badly. I mean, has, has, has this alarmed you somehow? I guess this reflects this excessive risk, yeah. reflects the fact that asset managers are, you know, fighting to get some sort of return in this era of negative interest rates. Uh, but this, you know, magnifies risks. So ha has AIOPA uh, posted a directive on that or, uh, it's really shocking, you know. I mean, if things go badly, you can lose up to two percent of your GDP. Yeah, we first of all, uh, we, we cannot issue a directive that's for the commission, we can only provide advice to the commission, for example. But what we have uh, done is we, we try to pass the message, especially when it comes to the IROP uh, sector. It is, uh, as, as I mentioned, the timing element is something that we all need to consider. It's not the same like. Uh, let me use the insurance sector that was also mentioned before by previous speakers. That is the closely, more closely related uh, sector. You do not have capital requirements, so you do not need to meet a specific requirement in the next year. So it's not uh, as alarming as it would have been to uh, any kind of financial institution falling below its capital requirements. Nonetheless, as you very rightly mentioned already, the impact is significant. We do see that if markets develop unfavorably, there will be what we call a severe widening of the pensions gap, a severe widening of the gap between the value of assets and the future value of liabilities. Then we enter the world of different national regimes. You have some regimes within Europe that they call directly for a decrease of the beneficiary income, which is something that is very unacceptable in other parts of Europe. There are other countries that, as I mentioned already, they wouldn't even consider decreasing uh, the income of uh, beneficiaries, ben the benefits of the, benef the benefits, uh, they, and they would uh, increase sponsor support. All these have the impact in real economy. And what we always try to bring is transparency. What we always try to bring from AOPA side is a supervisory awareness and market participant awareness. And what is always useful, we believe, from publications like the stress test is that participants can see and perhaps map how they do, how they look in a specific market scenario versus the rest of the industry. And when it comes to perhaps hunting yields in the current market conditions should not be the only priority unless, unless they have the risk management capacity to do so. Thank you. Okay, in the interest of time, let me, uh, so um, Michael, I'm passing you the questions. So by sure. I also have some uh, question, if I may, uh, to, uh, it, um, to, to, to Mr. Economo, uh, you mentioned at the end of your talk uh, that um, there's this, uh, uh, I mean, I haven't really uh, seen your talk only on the very last slide, uh, the importance of li life cycle investment. So especially this new environment with this, all these alternative investments, uh, how, how, how this strategy uh, take into account the age structure, let's say of a pension fund. Uh, in literature, what we have usually is that 
you know, when you are young, you can actually invest more in stocks. When you go older, you just have to uh, switch to to save for, let's say, investment. With this, this new environment, I'm wondering how this this uh, standard, let's say, life cycle uh, paradigm uh, is uh, is uh, adjusted. Uh, th thank you, thank you, Mihaly. Um, I have, I, th I believe that uh, life cycle uh, funds, sometimes also called target date refi retirement funds, have been a major progress in the industry. Right? They were first uh, introduced as a concept, and maybe we can share with our audience. First introduced a concept about uh, 20 years ago. I had the privilege of implementing a couple uh, life cycle return pro target date, as they're called now. Uh, retirement programs over the years, and they're typically uh, aimed at individual uh, accounts. Uh, and so a participant is able to choose a risk level, a fund, excuse me, an, an investment option that is tailored to her or his retirement date. And so the level of risk uh, taking into account and based on the literature that you mentioned uh, will vary over time uh, to take higher risk earlier in the career and reduce it uh, towards retirement. That today is an accepted best practice. We can debate on the level of risk. We can debate on the underlying investments. I believe there are significant ways to improve the efficiency of portfolios and what the industry standard is today, but there's a separate debate. As regards pension funds, um, my, I really appreciate your question because my research interest has been time horizon, which is uh, really in my mind, not taken into account enough in portfolio construction. Uh, there is a premium uh, to a long-term horizon seen as a practitioner. We can debate from an academic standpoint whether there, this is uh, true or not, obviously. But if you assume that there's a premium to a long-term horizon, uh, you should integrate this into portfolio construction. Uh, there is today no standard uh, to do that. And uh, rather, uh, portfolios uh, tend to be looked at versus liabilities, and liabilities are discounted against swap curves, which tends to bring a much more short-term view, because as the swap curves vary, you revalue the liabilities literally daily. In some countries, it's mandatory. And you tend to, therefore, uh, focus on the short-term performance, which as was mentioned by a couple of speakers, is really to some extent the opposite of what is required for, for success. Uh, I believe that uh, the, the question that is being asked, it is my experience by a number of allocators, is how can I maximize performance if I take into account the fact that part of the portfolio will have a very long-term horizon. In other words, part of the portfolio can stay illiquid for a very long time and could be even be accounted for on that basis. Again, there are some technicalities there such as accounting methods that influence behaviors and influence portfolio construction. Uh, I would therefore encourage, and I've had the chance to uh, have a number of discussions, uh, encourage integrating that long-term view uh, into portfolio construction. I notice, unfortunately, at least from my perspective, that this is not the case uh, yet, uh, but one would hope that uh, there will be an increasing trend in that direction. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Economo. So the next question comes from the audience. Uh, this is for uh, Dr. McCarthy. So uh, you, have uh, you have many times stressed the importance of the overall fee structure on the patient products and the necessity of for these products to fit this purpose, that is, uh, grew to, to, to cover the needs of future pensioners. Do you believe that uh, these in initiatives uh, like the drive uh, towards uh, ESG and the re recent uh, uh, EU regulation uh, externalize the cost of the, uh, in the in environmental policies to, to the pensioners? Um, you know that the 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 IOP regulation is pretty is pretty clear that that um, ESGs 
uh, ESG requirements subordinate to um, the, the importance of investing the assets entirely for the benefit of members. Um, and so, you know, ESG includes all the, all the stuff on climate change, um, all the stuff on, um, on in infrastructure, et cetera. Now, you know, the, the, the issue of externalities is really important. I mean, you know, if, if, if we don't uh, sort of take steps today to, to manage climate change, then the, the, world, the world will be, be worse for everybody at some point in the future. Right, so it's clear that steps need to be taken, but 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 the question is, uh, whose money should be used? Right, and 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 the, the the important question that needs to be asked is why should it be pension fund money, or pensioners' money, rather than somebody else's money? Right, and you know the 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 the, the great thing about pension funds from the point of view of people who want to use that money to achieve certain social goals is that the money is easily available. Right. Um, and pension funds are relatively slow moving. Um, but that isn't a reason to use pension fund money to achieve particular social objectives. And whatever those may be, and however desirable they are, um, the people put their money into the pension system with the trust that at the end of the day, the money is going to be invested for their benefit, not to serve the needs of, of other groups of society. And so for that reason, and in my, in my view, rightly, um, IORP places that, uh, that condition as the very first condition of uh, investment rules. And I think that that uh, reflects best practice around the world. So I think you also address the rest of the question that it appears, that appears on the screen. Um, let me I go to see, the... Sorry. Uh, so the, this uh, uh, is still for, uh, I think this is also for, uh, for uh, Professor McCarthy. The drift of the market to ESG investment increased to uh, increase the uh, research cost, of course, for picking the right securities. How pension funds will address that? And I guess this is also addressed to, to Mr. Economico. So Professor, uh, uh, Dr. McCarthy, uh, what is your, your, your view about this question? Um, you know, my view is, 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 is pretty simple on this, that, you know, there's um, pension funds don't need to uh, uh, expend any money on selecting securities if they follow the um, recommendations or the implications of the capital asset pricing model and diversify their portfolios as widely as possible. And the way they do that is by investing in very, very low cost index funds, um, which, uh, you know, um, Dr. Economou suggested are available for in bulk markets for a, at a price of zero. Um, and, and so if, if you do that as a pension fund, what you need to do rather than spending your uh, precious, the, the resources of your members um, on selecting securities is it, it, it's better then if you if, if you spend the resources of your members on determining an asset allocation strategy across the different sec security classes. Um, and then what you do basically is you rely on, on the capital markets, right, to ensure that those ESG securities and all other securities are efficiently priced, right? Um, which is why a, a very, very important ingredient in investment regulation is ensuring that capital markets work efficiently, right? And it's further why one of the great dangers of unlisted investments, private and private investments, is that investors no longer have the protection of the capital markets in ensuring that the securities that they buy are fairly priced, right? Instead, they rely on, as I said, asset managers or intermediaries who with the best will in the world are fundamentally conflicted. And I don't think it's impolite to point that out. I think it's essential to point that out, right? And so one of the great things about investing in index, index strategies is um, that you don't need to investigate uh, the, the pricing of different securities provided the capital markets function well, um, the, the securities are efficiently priced um, from your point of view. And furthermore, those, those types of products are available at almost zero cost, even in relatively small markets like Sweden. 
evening. So, Mr. Uh, Mr. Econo, this is also, uh, I guess, uh, is the question is also for you. And I, I, if I may add, this is also uh, a similar question can uh, can be asked uh, about uh, generally the private place, uh, the private placement. So, uh, th this cost is seems increasing uh, in in my point of view at least that. Uh, as a pension fund, you have to take, uh, of course, uh, ESG is really important and promising. And at the same time, as you have also mentioned, private placement is super important too. But there's a lot of cost involved for the research cost and, of course, uh, eval even valuation cost. Well, what's the view of this thing? How this thing can be efficient? Uh, thank you, Mihaly. Let me uh, perhaps and leave in the debate here, uh, the discussion a little bit with the debate uh, on these views. Uh, I will start with a purely theoretical basis. If you want to build an efficient portfolio, uh, it has been demonstrated 70 years ago uh, by Markowitz that this portfolio has to include the whole investable set, right? The entire economy. Uh, today, investing only in publicly accessible assets uh, fails by a long margin to meet that criteria. So from a pure theoretical perspective, if you want to build an efficient portfolio, and we had this discussion about maximizing efficiency as a prerequisite, as an objective, you have to include private assets, right? Uh, the second point uh, I'd like to make is that, yes, obviously investing in private assets makes sense only if you can achieve superior equal, excuse me, equal or superior risk adjusted returns. I clearly would disagree with the view that the superior historical returns are, pure, are attributable solely to increased risk. Uh, they can be attributed, and there are numerous studies in that regards, they can be attributed to the better uh, management that comes from the governance structure, the better alignment of incentives uh, for non-publicly traded uh, securities to the better to the to the capital structure that is uh, typically more uh, better matched to the nature uh, of the business and to uh, typically the improvements that can be done uh, on an operational basis because uh, much faster than in a public traded companies which has to be focused by definition on the short term so uh, again uh, in a theoretical world all assets would be accessed through the capital markets uh, and uh, well, through in, in trading markets, excuse me, in traded uh, trade securities. In practice, it's not the case. So the question becomes, and there is very clear evidence uh, that you can improve portfolios with the inclusion of private assets across the spectrum. The question becomes, how do you do this? And uh, obviously, that's where governance becomes extremely important. Clearly, Professor McCarthy identified a number of the risks that exist, and we could certainly make that list even much longer uh, when you invest in assets that are less uh, transparent. Uh, however, these risks uh, can be addressed, uh, including uh, conflict of interest. Conflict of interest exists across the entire chain of managing any portfolio, right? And they affect all participants. The question is that it is impossible to avoid them. However, it is desirable, it should be an objective to manage them in the best possible way. And the governance models, and I referenced two, uh, developed by Professor Ambakchir and Professor uh, Gordon Clark, identify exactly that, right? I once had with my board a big discussion with, with Professor Clark, who I divided, but how do we eliminate, uh, I had put on the agenda, how do we eliminate cards of interest? And his answer was, well, you can't do that. That's impossible. You just have to manage the council of interest. And the way to manage them is through transparency uh, on the decision-making, through transparency on the results, through transparency on the cost, transparency of the performance, through full transparency across the spectrum. And in the end, you get a better organization. So uh, if you put all this together, uh, the, 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 industry, the, the direction the industry is taking is to balance the best there is from an index portfolio, right, which has proven its ability to deliver uh, strong risk-adjusted performance historically. And certainly this remains the core of, of, of portfolios, even at very large pension funds. Uh, however, complemented, uh, and again, I'm coming here to a fiduciary responsibility today that in my view compels allocators to include private assets. 
complementing that with private assets. And it's not antithetical with meeting ESG goals or with serving a greater social purpose, right? When CDPQ built Highway 401 uh, uh, in Toronto, when uh, CDPQ financed the subway uh, in Montreal, this is not antithetical, right? We're in the business of making money and uh, we're identifying where there is demand and where capital doesn't meet the demand. And so, for example, if governments today are pushing massive amounts of capital to decarbonize entire industries over the long term, and the market is not efficient on the long term, the market is efficient on the short term, it's not efficient on the long term, right? Tesla wouldn't go from 20 to where it is today if the market was efficient on the long term. The market's efficient over horizons of six months to one year uh, or some, uh, perhaps a bit more, and we can get into an academic discussion about this. Uh, so as practitioners, what we have to look at is how do we make the most money in the most efficient uh, way for participants? And my message is that today it has to be a mix. Historically, the formula was very simple. I refer to Professor McCarthy, that was the past, an index portfolio, low fees, and you would beat your benchmark and do very well. Going forward, it is quite unlikely that this will be the recipe for success. And the industry consensus is that you will need a number of tools. And we'll learn more about this uh, at tomorrow's session from Nick Baltus on the systematic management side, by the way, which is how do you manage publicly traded securities in a more efficient fashion, right? That's what he will address at the lowest possible cost. Elise Gourier will address the traps and opportunities of private assets. And we'll hear from Ian Murray, Murray about why ESG actually makes sense and, and why uh, you can achieve there. And it's my convention there, I will step in and higher risk adjusted returns. Uh, if you can solve the puzzle that jo the, the, the George Skiadopoulos told us of actually better modeling uh, the, what is happening and the flood of money that will come in there. So a lot to do there and perhaps excuse me for enlivening the discussion but I've been an advocate of long-term horizon and, and including private investments in a portfolio. Uh, if I may respond, Mikhail. Of course, of course, of course. Um, just, just two points. I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what uh, uh, Professor Economo has said. Uh, just two points though. You know, the, 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 the great miracle of diversification is that the, 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 the largest share of the benefits of diversification come from the first few stocks. So, you know, if, if the, the, the marginal addition that the, the, the 5,000th stock adds to your uh, diversified portfolio, adds to your uh, Sharpe ratio is very, very, very small. So yes, the number of listed securities has fallen. Yes, only, you know, 50% of the, of the US economy is, is listed. But, but for, for, for all practical purposes, the, 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 the Sharpe ratio of, of the 50% that is listed is is not terribly different from the from the hundred percent um, that uh, in theory you get access to through access to illiquid markets, uh, sorry, unlisted assets. Um, and and the second point I want to emphasize um, is is what the task of regulators is, um, because I think that the task of regulators, rather than to to um, to let pension funds invest their money in this black hole of, of unlisted securities, I think that the, an important task for regulators in the future is, is to try and understand why it is that so few assets are listed, right? And that the number of listed assets has fallen, right? And to try and, and reverse that trend. And secondly, to ensure that ESG portfolios, infrastructure portfolios, Canadian highways, Australian highways, South African highways, um, to ensure that those assets are also listed and to try and find a way to, to, to create a governance framework that allows these types of long-run uh, investments to be listed. Because one of the great things about financial securities is that if you, if you, if you build a power station yourself, uh, you're stuck with the power station for 50 years. But if you buy a security in a company that, that builds a power station, um, you can sell that security to somebody else at any point in the future. And that's one of the great things about financial markets. And so I would say that a, 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 a challenge for the, for, the, for the regulators isn't necessarily to find ways to allow pension funds to invest in unlisted assets. What it is, is to try and ensure that assets that are currently unlisted 
um, are listed on stock exchange and stock and bond exchanges and made available to pension fund investors in a way that gives them the protection that capital markets provide. And in that way, I think we can we can achieve both both objectives uh, in a way that that is acceptable to the that exposes pension fund members to acceptable risks. I see. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Professor Chakologlu left uh, the room uh, because at this particular uh, uh, issue in Greece, the occupational pension fund are allowed to invest to, to private placement only 5% of their, uh, this is by, this is the law at least. So this should be changed, uh, of course, with uh, some uh, further uh, uh, transparency issues regarding how the, de the decision process is going to be made. But uh, I, I, I guess yeah. Professor, Professor McCarthy would argue that it should be changed to zero, and I would argue that it should be left up to the uh, to, to the allocators. Okay, and, cool. And there should be no such cap. Uh, you know, I take I take all the points that Professor McCarthy put on the table. Uh, very uh, respectable points, all of them. Diversification remains uh, a key point. Diversification is not antithetical with including private assets, right? Uh, on the contrary, as I said, because we're trying to mirror the entire set. You talked about stocks, I'll talk about debt. If you look at debt indices, they're not diversified. Corporate debt indices are dominated by those firms that issue debt, right? So you'll have enormous amounts of telecom. If you look back in the 2000s, the amount of debt that went bankrupt, that went belly up, was a major part of debt indices, uh, corporate debt indices. Because who's borrowing here? It's telecom and it's financials, right? So the, these indices are not diversified to begin with. Uh, I would take a little bit of an issue with the black hole denomination for unlisted securities. It's not because security is not listed that somehow it's opaque. Uh, there is clearly um, a disclosure uh, if, if it is of any size in the US at least for debt issues. And it is certainly not uh, it is certainly a fiduciary duty of allocators uh, to do their homework when investing. In fact, I would argue that the same type of investigative work uh, that is being done in public securities uh, is done even better in private space, because in public securities, you rely on market efficiency, which leads often to uh, perhaps not digging as deep as, 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 as necessary. Whereas in private markets, you have to dig into, into the structures. Uh, and in particular context where regulation, and I admire what you said, Professor, that regulation should drive more firms to be, to be public. Uh, amen, that would be terrific. Uh, in the quarter century that I've been involved in the markets, it's the opposite that's been happening. Regulation has driven firms away from public markets. Annual reports, which used to be 30 pages, today are 200. Board members that used to be fairly shielded from um, litigation, uh, today uh, are exposed to enormous amounts of litigation so that if you look at the quality of board members, it has declined significantly. No person, no, no successful businessman who has become wealthy would want to become today a board member of a large US company. So regulation has gone, in, as a practitioner in the opposite direction. And uh, this, is, this is unfortunate. Uh, and, and, and where it leaves us as practitioners is uh, it, 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 it directs us to uh, private companies where uh, you can identify clear drivers for, for strong performance, uh, either because uh, a, a necessity to include them in portfolios. And again, corporate debt is a key area where uh, being exposed to indices uh, leads you to non-diversified and volatile investments. Uh, personally, I just close on one point, I'd love to own a utility in a pension fund. Uh, it is an ideal investment. And of course, if it is, if it is appropriately sized relative to the horizon and relative to appropriate diversification and, and, and risk tolerance. But today what, what pension funds are looking are really a series of utilities. In the UK, for example, private gas distribution businesses uh, are owned increasingly by pension funds, uh, both the debt and the equity, because it has such a nice profile and you own these for 50 years and, and these match the, the, the profiles. So a lot of uh, debate, uh, but uh, Mikhail, I want to thank yeah, yeah. Uh, David McCarthy for generating uh, 
this uh, this further debate. Uh, so and, this was uh, this was really really interesting, and uh, I, I I hope we had more time, but this is not the case, unfortunately. There is a last question for, from from uh, the audience. Uh, this comes from uh, Imperial College for Mr. Fr Francesco Borderi. Uh, this is addressed to to Mr. Uh, Zafiris. Uh, regarding the slide on uh, uh, occupational pension fund asset allocation, uh, I have noticed that the real estate allocation uh, varies uh, substantially across the various countries. So this is uh, is something is this something uh, fundamental behind this, or uh, as uh, Francesco said uh, he was expecting to to have a more uni uniform allocation since uh, this funds has pretty much the same investment goal. Thanks. It's a good question. It's actually one of the elements that we are also looking into the different asset allocation between member states, but it's not unique to the pension sector, the, especially when it comes to real estate. The, these differences from country to country, we are also witnessing in the on the insurance sector that we have much more granular information. You may see countries and there it's already public what I'm going to say from country to country. You may see the Netherlands with exposures to real estate, be it through direct lending. They act as banks, insurers, or be through uh, funds that they invest in real estate in the excess of 20% of the portfolio. And then you compare this, you can compare this to Italy, for example, which is in the area of 1%. And uh, I would make, uh, let's say, this the reference also to the insurance sector to prove that it has nothing to do with a regulatory framework, because in the insurance sector, you have a common regulatory framework as opposed to what goes on in the pension sector. Uh, but it has to do with the maturity of the market, perhaps. It has to do with the returns previously, uh, let's say, uh, accumulated through other types of securities, uh, like uh, perhaps high yielding government yields coming from the past that did not provide the incentive to some, let's say, uh, countries to look for alternative forms of investment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So different national characteristics would always drive, uh, let's say, different types of investment. And going perhaps on the, on the topic that you were uh, mentioning before, when it comes also to non-listed or perhaps private equity, etc., there's also a huge difference from country to country when it comes to that, because uh, indeed uh, the maturity of the market, the maturity of the analysis uh, really varies a lot from country to country. So it is also the, it has to do with the culture of the, I guess, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the whole system. A lot. Society. Oh, that's a very good point. It's also with the culture because again, we can witness, for example, when it comes to equity, Listed and unlisted, you may see that the Scandinavian countries, Nordic countries, they always have at the quite again around the area of 18 to 20 percent exposure to equities. You may go to the UK and see very high exposure to corporate bonds, and then when you move to continental Europe, you will see much more exposures to fixed income assets. And the southern you go, you will see also a lot of uh, government uh, bond exposure. Yeah, I, I, I love to have more uh, time because I also have some questions, but I will stop <laughs> now. It, it was really a pleasure for, to be a chair for this wonderful session. Thank you all speakers and the audience for the, for the, for the participation. I will give the floor to, to George so he can uh, 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 make the, the appointment for tomorrow. And uh, thank you so much for your, uh, for, for, for your participation. Thank you, Michalis. Thank you, Dimitris, David, and uh, Theodore. So thank you, uh, you as well, our audience. So uh, we are going to meet again tomorrow for the second session, as well as for the panel. So the time for tomorrow is 2.15 uh, GMT time. So we're looking forward to seeing you all uh, tomorrow. Have um, a nice day or evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.